Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, today, Her Honour Judge Joanna Corner will be handing down her ruling following the mock hearing that we hosted on the 19th of February. That hearing was hosted by the Global Legal Action Network in partnership with Bellingcat and the OSR for Rights Project at Swansea University. I should emphasize again, as I did at the hearing itself on that date, that this is a mock hearing. And the purpose of this exercise has been to test the admissibility of a piece of open source evidence from the conflict in Yemen into criminal proceedings in the courts of England and Wales, and thus test the methodology designed by Glon and Bellingcat. I would also stress that given the fictitious nature of this exercise, any decision reached by our judge will have no legal weight in future in any real proceedings brought in any jurisdiction in respect of the conflict in Yemen. This is therefore not to be taken as a guide as to what might actually happen in a real trial. Nevertheless, we have all been waiting with bated breath to find out what her honor, her honor Judge Corner has decided. So I will hand over to her now to hand down her ruling. Yes, thank you very much, um, Siobhan. As I indicated at the um, end of um, the hearing, I would take time to consider my ruling uh, on this matter. Uh, and uh, therefore today's uh, uh, the hearing is uh, for me to deliver that ruling. Uh, the organizers have been provided with a written copy as have counsel uh, for both sides um, before uh, the hearing. So this is the ruling on the defense application to exclude evidence under section 78 of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act otherwise known uh, as PACE 1984. I start with the allegations in the case. Uh, the defendant, Saud Katani, is charged on an indictment containing two counts. Count one charges him with the war crime of violence to life and persons. Count two charges him with the war crime of attacking civilians. Uh, both counts are contrary to section 51 of the International Criminal Court Act 2001. Uh, Katani is a pilot with the Saudi Royal Air Force. Uh, the prosecution alleges that on the 7th of May 2018, at about 10.30 in the morning, he flew his flight jet above Tahrir Street in Sana'a, Yemen, and launched two air-delivered bombs in a tactic known as double tap. Uh, that is to say, a first bomb is dropped and then the pilot returns to carry out a second strike as rescue work is taking place. This is a densely populated civilian area and the office of the presidency is located on that street. Uh, the airstrike is said to have killed at least six civilians and wounded many others. Evidence is available from a doctor who treated 13 casualties, three of whom died from their injuries. Investigations into the incident began in July 2019 and were originally carried out by an organization known as Bellingcat, to whom the matter had been referred by another organization known as the Global Legal Action Network uh, in other words, GLAN. The investigations carried out by Bellingcat included conducting searches on social media. A search on Twitter uh, produced a video which now bears the exhibit number CG2, uh, which is said to show uh, the uh, result of the airstrikes. On the 15th of June, 2020, uh, Bellingcat and Glan contacted the War Crimes Unit of the Metropolitan Police Counter-Terrorism Command, providing them with details of the evidence uh, gathered, which it was said implicated Katani. Uh, the reason for the referral was that Katani was due to arrive at Heathrow uh, imminently. A warrant was issued and he was duly arrested. He was interviewed in the presence of a solicitor. Originally, he denied the offences, uh, but eventually admitted carrying out the airstrike, uh, but said it took place 
uh, at uh, 7 a.m. when no civilians uh, were present and denied it was a civilian area. He was charged with the two offenses and was sent for trial to the Central Criminal Court. I turn now to the procedural history. Uh, the trial was listed to take place in November 2020, but was not able to start as a result of the backlog which resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic. It is now due to take place immediately after Easter. In December of last year, the court was notified that the defence objected to the admissibility of the video and the expert evidence of Frank Palmer. Uh, accordingly, a pretrial hearing was listed to take place before me on the 19th of February uh, of this year. In advance of the hearing, I received skeleton arguments and copies of the relevant authorities from both sides. I express my gratitude to all counsel for their succinct and helpful written submissions, which enabled the proceedings to be completed within the allocated time of two hours. Uh, the hearing took the form of a voir dire, uh, with the prosecution calling two witnesses, uh, Elliot Higgins, uh, the executive director of Bellingcat, and Frank Palmer, an analyst of open source material. The time constraints did not allow for anything other than the introduction of their witness statements into evidence and brief cross-examination, uh, which perforce had to concentrate on general topics rather than the detail of their evidence. Oral legal submissions were also limited. And this ruling, uh, and I emphasize this, is therefore subject to these limitations. At the conclusion of the proceedings, I indicated I would give my ruling at a later date. Uh, subsequent to the conclusion of the hearing, I sought and received uh, written submissions from both sides uh, on the applicability uh, of the uh, case of Myers against the Queen reported 2016 appeal cases 314. I turn now to the evidence um, uh, in this case. Uh, CG2 was downloaded from Twitter. It is said to depict the events after the first strike. The following matters are not in dispute. First, uh, the Saudi-led coalition announced that they had carried out an airstrike at the presidential palace on the 7th of May. CG2 is made up of two separate segments. Seemingly, segment two uh, was filmed before segment one. Accordingly, either there were two separate videos which have been spliced together or one with video with the order reversed. Three, the makers or maker of the video, uh, singular or plural, uh, is or are unknown. Four, CG42, sorry, CG2 is not the original video, nor is it known which version thereof it is. Uh, fifth, the identity of the person who uploaded the video is not known, but examination of his Twitter account shows that he only tweets about Saudi airstrikes and not Houthi attacks often retweets exaggerated claims about casualties and has in the past uh, tweeted unreliable things. And finally, the uploading of a video onto Twitter uh, has the effect of, as it's described, stripping uh, the original metadata, that is to say, uh, the maker, uh, the date of creation and any modification. The search which produced the video was conducted by an employee of Bellingcat called Charlotte Goddard. Uh, the search terms used were in Arabic, uh, which translated as Office of the Presidency Sana, with a date range of May the 7th to May the 10th, 2018. CG2 
also records some of the utterances made by persons present, present during the filming. Uh, some have been translated by Bellingcat and appear as subtitles. Uh, Mr. Higgins, in his statement, at paragraph 19, says no reliance is placed on statements that are made in the video, uh, nor is any placed on the text accompanying the video. Mr. Higgins, uh, who has been examining, uh, as he put it, conflict videos since 2011, also addressed the reliability of CG2 in the same paragraph of his statement, saying that when considering such open source material, there were three main issues, which in summary are, first, staging or repurposing, that is to say, uh, the footage, whilst authentic, has been set up or represents a wholly different incident. Uh, digital alteration, uh, as the uh, second issue. And finally, omission, that is to say the maker has deliberately not filmed a military base in close vicinity to the area targeted. Whilst Mr. Higgins was not called as an expert witness, he expressed the view that in respect of CG2, the factors of staging or repurposing and digital alteration could be discounted. And in respect of omission, whilst accepting that this was a possibility, asserted that it could not affect the clear evidence that civilians were present and that the skies were clear at the time of the attack. In cross-examination, Higgins agreed that First, information favorable to the defense may have been edited out. Second, there may have been military personnel present at the scene or weapons. Third, no opinions had been sought from experts in technology or, in technology or weaponry. Fourth, there was no duty imposed on investigators to record system failures and fifth, there was no mandatory peer review of findings made. Mr. Palmer, in his statement, explains that he was instructed to assess the location and time of the events and to make an assessment of the authenticity of the video. His qualifications for carrying out this task are set out at the beginning of his statement and were addressed in cross-examination and re-examination. Uh, they include, first, a background in the military, but he accepted uh, that bombs and missiles launched from aircraft were a specialist uh, topic um, in the military. Uh, he had not undertaken this specialism but had experience from his work examining similar videos. Second, he was introduced to techniques such as geolocation whilst in the army and now taught them himself. Third, uh, he had a master's degree in conflict security and development and one of the modules lasting six months focused on the use of open source material an identification of whether the image was a genuine one. Fourth, he had investigations experience for two years in cyber threat intelligence analysis, specializing in the use of open source information uh, to identify and assess threats. Fourth, uh, no, fifth, um, that he had been conducting investigations for Bellingcat from 2016, uh, first as a volunteer, then as a full-time employee from 2018. Uh, his statement details his analysis of CG2. Uh, the sequence of events, which are illustrated with stills taken from the video, uh, his use of chronolocation, that is to say, as explained by Mr. Higgins, in fact, the technique of identifying the exact or approximate time at which an incident occurred or at which a piece of audiovisual content was created. 
Uh, third, his use of geolocation, that is to say the process or technique of identifying the geographical location of a person, object, or event. And fourth, uh, cross-referencing with other content for corroboration and consistency, including internal consistency. He concluded uh, that the strike took place no earlier than 10.24 a.m. and no later than 10.44 a.m. in the vicinity of the office of the presidency. He also stated that there was no indication of manipulation of the video. His statement at paragraph 34 referred to the metadata and EXIF uh, exchangeable image file, which in fact were not present. But in cross-examination, he added that this was only one part of the verification process and that the geolocation process showed no, no such evidence, nor in his view was there sufficient time to perform such manipulation uh, between the attack taking place and the video being uploaded at 7.45 p.m. on the same day. In further cross-examination, he accepted that, as an expert witness, he owed a duty to the court and had a duty to be objective. Uh, second, his duty, he, he had a duty to disclose any material relied upon in his analysis and any which might undermine his conclusion. Uh, algorithms are built into search engines which can control what is uncovered. But he stated that open source investigators carry out measures to mitigate this as set out in the Barclay Protocol. It is assumed that this was a reference uh, to that part of section six, which is headed uh, bias. Uh, the number of users on a site could affect the algorithm. And in re-examination, uh, he stated that algorithms do, do not, however, edit or change the result. And the use of algorithms, he accepted, uh, meant that there was no such thing as uh, what is called a neutral search. Finally, it was possible, uh, he accepted it was possible that the video uh, had been alter, altered, sorry, and given the order of events, it had been edited. Finally, in answer to a question asked by me, he said that he was not a digital forensic expert, which he defined as looking at, say, for example, the manipulation of metadata of an image or the image itself. So I turn now uh, to the submissions which were made. Uh, the defense submissions in summary are that CG2 should be excluded as it is neither authentic nor reliable, since first, it is not the original video, nor is it known which iteration thereof it purports to be. Second, the identity of the creator is unknown, but the person who uploaded uh, it is known to be biased. Third, it has been manipulated and no original metadata is available. Fourth, its discovery on the internet was subject to the unavoidable bias of the search engine. Uh, their second submission uh, related to Mr. Palmer, and it was that the report and evidence given by Mr. Palmer does not comply with the requirements of Rule 19 of the Criminal Procedure Rules uh, and should therefore be excluded. In particular, it is submitted that uh, first, his opinion and conclusions are based on the data from the video, which is fatally flawed uh, because it is not authentic. Second, he has not confined himself to his area of expertise. Third, he has drawn conclusions, some of which are for the jury. And fourth, he is not independent or objective. 
Uh, both areas of evidence it is submitted should be excluded under the provisions of section 78 of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984, which reads, in any proceedings, the court may refuse to allow evidence on which the prosecution proposes to rely to be given if it appears to the court that having regard to all the circumstances, including the circumstances in which the evidence was obtained, the admission of the evidence would have such an adverse effect on the fairness of the proceedings that the court ought not to admit it. The prosecution in response, again, in summary, is to this effect. The video is admissible as real evidence subject to proof of provenance or retrieval. The utterances heard on the video are admissible by virtue of section 118.4 of the Criminal Justice Act 2003 as raised gesti or alternatively under section 114 1D as being in the interests of justice. Third, that the examination by Mr. Palmer found no reason to doubt its authenticity. Fourth, that the events shown in CG2 are corroborated by other shorter clips which were uploaded to Twitter, as well as the evidence of the doctor who treated uh, the civilian casualties. And fifth, that Mr. Palmer had the required uh, experience and expertise to conduct such an analysis. Both prosecution and defense counsel provided me with copies of the relevant legislation and copies of authorities on which reliance was placed. Uh, those authorities included some from the International Criminal Court. Uh, these, whilst of assistance, cannot in any way be considered binding upon this court. I have read all the material put before me, but will refer only to those which in my judgment were the most pertinent to this ruling. I propose to deal first with the issue of Mr. Palmer's expertise, as his evidence, if accepted, uh, has a bearing on the admissibility of uh, CG2. So I turn now to the law on expert evidence. The Criminal Practice Directions 2015 at paragraph 19A1 state, uh, expert opinion evidence is admissible in criminal proceedings at common law if in summary, uh, first, it is relevant to a matter in issue in the proceedings. Second, it is needed to provide the court with information likely to be outside the court's own knowledge and experience. And third, the witness is competent to give that opinion. And I emphasize that uh, third uh, provision. Paragraph 19A.5 lists the factors uh, which the court may take into account in determining the reliability of expert opinion, which includes the nature of the data on which the expert's opinion is based, the safety or otherwise of inferences drawn, the nature of the methods used, the extent to which any material upon which the expert's opinion is based has been peer reviewed, the extent to which the expert's opinion is based on material falling outside the expert's own field of expertise, and whether the expert's uh, methods follows, followed established practice in the field. The Criminal Procedure Rules 2020 at Part 19 set out the steps which must be taken before expert evidence may be admitted and include at uh, paragraph 19.2, uh, an expert must help the court to achieve the overriding objective, A, uh, by giving opinion which is um, objective and, bio and unbiased and within the expert's area or areas of uh, expertise. 
Before turning to the English authorities, I should mention the test for admissibility of evidence as set out in Article uh, 69D, uh, six, I'm sorry, 69.4 of the ICC statute and interpreted in cases which are of most relevance uh, to this issue. Uh, I then quote and do not propose to repeat uh, the, uh, which, the words of Article 69.4. Uh, in the Katanga and Chewy decision of the 21st of October 2013, and paragraph 15, the trial cha chamber stated, the chamber follows a three-step approach. First, the chamber must assess whether a profit item of evidence is relevant to a live issue in the case. If so, the chamber must then determine whether it has sufficient probative value. Probative value is evaluated on the basis of two factors, reliability and significance. Uh, finally, once it has been established uh, that an item of evidence has sufficient probative value, the chamber must still examine uh, whether its admission would cause undue prejudice to the opposing party. Uh, if the chamber finds that the prejudice is dis disproportionate to the probative value of the evidence, it must be excluded. Uh, those terms are not dissimilar uh, to the terms of section 78. And in an earlier decision uh, in that case, uh, dated December the 10th, uh, uh, 2010, when discussing the criteria of admissibility, uh, the trial chamber at paragraph 23 stated, it is for the party tendering the item uh, to provide admissible evidence demonstrating its authenticity. Such evidence may be direct or circumstantial, but must provide reasonable grounds to believe that the exhibit uh, is authentic which although not a particular high standard, uh, does impose a burden of proof on the party tendering the evidence. And at paragraph 24, uh, videos, films, photographs, and audio recordings uh, before video or audio, audio material can be admitted, the chamber will require evidence of originality and integrity. However, once this has been established, this type of exhibit may often be admitted as evidence that speaks for itself and may be regarded in this respect as real evidence. Uh, since the relevance of audio or video material depends on the date and or location of the recording, uh, evidence must be provided in that respect. Uh, in the case of Al Wafale, in the decision of the 4th of July, 2018, the trial chamber considered the admissibility of a video similar in type to CG2 and concluded at paragraph uh, 18, the chamber is satisfied that the above mentioned video has sufficient indicia of authenticity in order to be relied on at this stage of the proceedings. And the chamber notes in particular that the prosecutor has submitted an expert report on the authentication of the video prepared by a renowned independent institute. Having analyzed the video and its key frames, the report concluded there were no traces of forgery or manipulation in relation to locations, weapons, or persons shown in the video. I turn now to English law, which is characteristically pragmatic uh, as to the uh, test for uh, establishing expertise. Lord Justice Bingham, as he then was in the case of the Queen and Rob, reported in 1991, stated, this appeal raises questions touched on, but not discussed in depth in the authorities. What characterizes a field as one in which expertise may exist 
and what qualifies or disentitles a witness to give evidence of his opinion as an expert. The old established academically based sciences, such as medicine, geology or metallurgy, and the established professions such as architecture, quantity surveying or engineering present no problem. Uh, the field will be regarded as one in which expertise may exist and any properly qualified member will be accepted without question as an expert. Expert evidence is not, however, limited to these core areas. Expert evidence of fingerprints, handwriting and accident reconstruction is regularly given. Opinions may be given of the market value of land, ships, pictures or rights. Expert opinions may be given of the quality of commodities uh, or on the literary, artistic, scientific or other merits of works alleged to be obscene. Some of these fields are far removed from anything which could be called a formal scientific discipline. Thus, the essential questions are whether study and experience will give a witness's opinion an authority which the opinion of one not so qualified uh, will lack. Uh, that said, by whatever method the expertise is acquired, the expert must be confined to matters within his area or areas of expertise. In Rob, in Rob Lord Justice Bingham stated at page 166, we are alive to the risk that if in a criminal case the Crown are permitted to call an expert witness of some uh, but tenuous qualifications, uh, the burden of proof may imperceptibly shift and a burden be cast on the defendant to rebut a case which should never have been before the jury at all. A defendant cannot fairly be asked to meet evidence of opinion given by a quack, a charlatan or an enthusiastic amateur. The defense also rely on what was said by the president of the Queen's Bench Division in the case of Lugols and others uh, reported in 2013. These were conjoined appeals uh, dealing with the admissibility of low template DNA evidence. And at paragraph eight, he stated, it was the primary submission of the appellants in each case that unless statistical evidence of match probability could be given, uh, then evaluative evidence should not be admitted. That was because the jury needed to have a firm basis on which they could evaluate the significance of the evidence given. In the absence of statistical evidence, it was not possible to do so. Uh, end quote. He continued in the next paragraph, we cannot accept that argument. As is clear from the judgments in, um, and he quotes um, other cases, the fact that there is no reliable statistical basis <coughs> does not mean that a court cannot admit an evaluative opinion, provided there is some other sufficiently reliable basis for it, its admissions. Paragraph 11 of the same judgment on which the defense place emphasis stated, it is essential to recall the principle which is applicable, uh, namely in determining the ad, ad issue of admissibility, the court must be satisfied that there is a sufficiently reliable scientific basis for the evidence to be admitted. If there is, then the court leaves the opposing views to be tested before the jury. And finally, in paragraph 14, the president went on to say, in our view, an expert is not bound to express an evaluative opinion by reference to the hierarchy. He can use other phrases. The real significance of the expert's inability to use the hierarchy might be that it is indicative of the lack of a proper basis on which to express an opinion. In our view, it can be no more than that. It is a matter to be taken into account in an assessment of whether there is a sufficiently reliable scientific basis for such evaluative opinion to be given. 
Uh, the criminal practice direction and the criminal practice rules and the authorities referred to above set out the general principles which must be applied when consideration is being given to the admission of expert evidence. In my judgment, the closest analogy to the evidence sought to be admitted in this case is that relating to evidence by police officers of drug prices or gang membership. Uh, this type of evidence was dealt with by the Privy Council in the conjoined cases of Myers and others uh, against the Queen, reported uh, in 2016. Each appeal concerned the admission of gang evidence primarily to demonstrate that the defendant had a motive to kill the victim. The issues as set out in the judgment delivered by Lord Hughes were defined as follows. If gang evidence is admissible, what is its proper extent and content? If admissible, whether gang evidence can be given by a police officer who has made a special study of the gangs concerned, as well as of gang culture generally. If gang evidence is admissible, to what extent, if any, may the witness rely on information gathered from or researched by others? Uh, when dealing with police officers as expert witnesses, Lord Hughes stated at paragraph uh, 57, a police officer has been permitted to give expert evidence about criminal behavior. An example is evidence of the customary practices of drug users in relation to such matters as packaging, methods, and quantity of usage and supply and prevailing price. This type of evidence was held admissible. Evidence of the practice, mores, and associations of gangs, whether general or particular, is in a similar category. It has been received in several jurisdictions and there can in principle be no objection to it being given by a police officer, providing that the ordinary threshold requirements for expertise are established and provided that the ordinary rules as to the giving of expert evidence are observed. He continued at paragraph 58, the particular issues which may arise when a new scientific theory is advanced do not arise here, uh, but the officer uh, must have made a sufficient study, um, uh, whether by formal training or through practical experience, to assemble what can properly be regarded as a balanced body of specialized knowledge, which would not be available to the tribunal of fact. The defense in their written submissions on this authority argue that Mr. Palmer does not possess the same level of expertise as was apparently possessed by the police officer who gave evidence at the trial. That may or may not be the case, but it is the principles which appear to me to be of universal application, which are of importance, namely, that employment by an organization which could be said to have an interest in the outcome of the case is not an automatic bar to providing expert evidence. And second, that expertise may be derived, uh, and I quote, through practical experience to assemble what can properly be regarded as a balanced body of specialist knowledge, which would not be available to the tribunal of fact. My ruling on the admissibility of uh, the evidence of Mr. Palmer. Uh, the field of analysis of video material to establish its significance, reliability, or authenticity is one which appears to be of relatively recent origin and is one which is composed of a number of factors. One is the application of technical knowledge. Uh, for example, an understanding of the operation of metadata and methods of digital alteration. Another is knowledge of techniques such as geolocation and chronolocation. However, much of the analysis relies upon factors such as the use of search engine, engines for obtaining satellite imagery uh, and evidence which supports or undermines the content of the video, 
uh, which do not require specialist expertise, but are derived from training and experience in the examination of such material. The Barclay Protocol, referred to by Messrs Higgins and Palmer, sets out the methodology required to conduct proper investigations uh, on, into open source uh, material. Uh, whilst Mr. Palmer has no technical knowledge in respect of metadata or digital alteration, his other qualifications, and more to the point, his experience in this kind of analysis, make him a person who is able to, and again, I quote, assemble what can properly be described as a balanced body of specialized knowledge, uh, which would not be available to the tribunal of fact. Having heard him give evidence, I am satisfied uh, that he is giving an opinion which is objective and unbiased and within his area of expertise. In the words of Lord Bingham, he is not a quack, a charlatan, or an enthusiastic amateur. I find that with the exception of peer review, he fulfills the criteria uh, set out in part 19 of the criminal practice direction. Accordingly, I am satisfied that he may be considered as an expert in this field. And having regard to all the circumstances, including the circumstances in which the evidence was obtained, there is no reason to exclude his evidence under section 78 of PACE. In respect of the matters which the defense say are not for him, but for the jury, of which only one example is given, that is to say the number of casualties which may be seen on the video. If agreement is not reached with the prosecution, uh, the, these can be raised before he gives evidence. The jury will be directed that as with any other witness, it is their task to weigh up the evidence of Mr. Palmer, uh, which includes any evidence of opinion, and to decide what they accept and what they do not. They will be told that they should evaluate his qualifications, practical experience, methodology, source material, and the quality of his analysis. I turn now to the admissibility of the video exhibit CG2. As already stated, the prosecution argue that it, it is admissible as real evidence uh, subject to proof of prov provenance, retrieval, and authenticity, whilst the defense argue for its exclusion uh, on the basis that the circumstances, uh, the circumstances of its retrieval make it unauthentic and unreliable. Uh, in support of the prosecution submission that the video is real evidence, I was referred to the authority of Sapporo Maro uh, against the Statute of Liberty, reported in 1968, in which a mechanically produced film of the echoes made by two ships which collided in the River Thames was objected to by the defendants. Uh, Sir Jocelyn Simon uh, ruled that in his view, uh, the evidence is admissible and could indeed be a valuable piece of evidence in the elucidation of the facts in dispute. Adding, in my view, uh, the evidence in question has nothing to do with the hearsay rule. It is in the nature of real evidence. Uh, and uh, that is then defined. The defense do not seek to argue to the contrary. The admission into evidence of anonymous pieces of films has been considered in other cases which, has come, which have come before the UK courts. In the Queen Against Murphy, reported in the Northern Ireland Raw Reports in 1990, uh, the Northern Irish Court of Appeal dealt with the admissibility of film clips, which were not the original footage, shot by a cameraman who was not called as a witness. It had been included in a BBC News report and evidence was called to verify that transmission. Uh, the objections to admission of this evidence by the defence were in terms not dissimilar to those advanced by the defence in this case, i.e. that it was only admissible 
if the cameraman was called or it was an authentic copy of the original. Uh, the court upheld the trial judge's decision to admit the film, uh, stating that once the clips were found to be relevant and prima facie authentic, they were admissible. Uh, at, uh, at page 61, Lord Justice Kelly stated, any attack thereafter could only go to weight. The issue of weight could embrace many things. Uh, further inquiries into its authenticity, its provenance and history, and whether it was original, and if not, how it came to be copied. Authenticity, in our view, like most facts, may be proved circumstantially. The film may be proved authentic by comparing it with films taken by others of the same event, taken at the same time, or even at a different time. Uh, in the case of The Queen and Anjad, uh, 2016, reported in 2016, uh, a case involving the collection of information contrary to Section 51B of the Terrorism Act 2000, the Court of Appeal Criminal Division considered the admission into evidence of documents obtained from the internet, and in particular, one from Wikipedia, uh, by police officers doing a Google search for documents similar to a training list written by the defendant. The officers did not know who had written the items thrown up by their search, uh, nor indeed when they were posted. No expert was called to confirm authorship of the document, uh, which bore striking similarities to that written by the defendant. Uh, the Court of Appeal upheld the trial judge's decision on the basis that the internet material was not relied on for the truth of its contents but to show that the defendant's documents, and I quote, was derived from sources associated with a terrorist cause, or whether or not the information uh, drawn from the internet were true. And that was paragraph 35. The difference between that case and the present one is that CG2 is being adduced for the truth of its contents. Uh, and the Court of Appeal did express its surprise that, and again I quote, the Crown made no effort to canvas expert evidence, at least capable of establishing the provenance of some, if not all, open source material, and perhaps of establishing authenticity and accuracy. Uh, that was paragraph 37. However, they did so on the basis that it may have tempered, uh, the word used by the Court of Appeal, the direction given by the judge to the jury that they should not convict on the basis alone of the internet document, but merely treat it as some support for the prosecution case. Uh, in respect of the utterances heard on the video, as already stated, the prosecution rely on section 118.4a, the Criminal Justice Act 2003, which is headed raised gesti, uh, which reads as follows, any rule of law under which in criminal proceedings a statement is admissible as evidence of any matter stated if a the statement was made uh, by a person so emotionally overpowered by an event that the possibility of concoction or distortion can be disregarded. And in the alternative, the prosecution rely on section 114 1D uh, which states in, in, in criminal proceedings, a statement not made in oral evidence in the proceedings is admissible as evidence of any matter stated if, but only if, the court is satisfied that it is in the interest of justice for it to be admissible. And for section 114.2 sets out the factors um, which meet, which need to be taken into account uh, when considering admission. My ruling. In my judgment, it is clear from the legislation and authorities to which I have been referred uh, that the UK courts have taken the view uh, that the rules which required the exclusion of evidence not strictly proved have had to be amended to take account of modern forms uh, of the creation uh, storage and communication of evidence. It is in the interests of justice that such amendments should take place. 
Equally, the interests of justice require that care is taken by judges before admitting into evidence material, particularly that obtained from internet searches, which is adduced for the purpose of convicting a defendant of a crime. Recent events, whilst outside the sphere of criminal trials, have all too clearly shown the dangers of material being uploaded to the internet, which uh, is colloquially described as fake news. The factors most pertinent to the admission of such evidence in a criminal trial are whether the material sought to be adduced is relevant, authentic, reliable. In respect of the video, exhibit CG2, uh, it is clearly relevant. As regards authenticity, it suffers from the drawbacks that the creator is unknown. Uh, it is not uh, the original, um, nor does it have any of the electronic data attached, which allows to be technical checks to be carried out on the time, date, and location of the content. In terms of liability, there is the possibility that whoever uploaded the video has edited it uh, to remove aspects which do not suit his purpose. For example, the presence of military personnel uh, in the area, uh, at the scene. However, the decisions to which I have referred make it clear that authenticity and reliability may be established for the purpose of, of, of admission by other evidence. And in this case, I find that there is such evidence, namely uh, the findings made by um, Mr. Palmer, other postings on Twitter corroborating that an attack took place on that date, time and place, the evidence of the doctor of the casualties treatment, uh, treated, the evidence of the time at which the video was uploaded to Twitter, which did not allow for the kind of sophisticated alteration which would be needed for the manipulation of the contents to take place. Uh, the content of the video itself, that is to say the damage to the area and the acceptance by the defendant that he took part in an attack uh, on that day. In the light of these findings, I am satisfied that exhibit CG2 fulfills the criteria for admission into evidence and decline to order its exclusion under the provisions of section 78. The jury will be given appropriate directions and warnings in respect of the identified drawbacks which relate to the evidence. However, I've also considered whether admission of the video should include the utterances therein. Whilst I accept the prosecution submissions that they fall within the raised gesti provisions, I cannot overlook the fact that Mr. Higgins made it clear that these were not relied upon. In my judgment, any probative value they may have is outweighed by their prejudicial effect. And accordingly, I exercise my discretion under um, uh, section 78 um, to exclude the evidence, to exclude that aspect of the video, uh, which must therefore be edited to remove those utterances. In conclusion, I say this, this ruling, as already stated, is subject to the limitations of the hearing uh, as set out in paragraph 10 of this judgment. It is, of course, open to the defense to renew this application should further evidence become available at a later stage of the trial. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Your Ladyship, for such a detailed and clear ruling. Um, to close off this exercise, we would just like to say an enormous thank you to all of our participants who have all put so much time, thought and effort into this exercise. Um, it's made it not only incredibly informative and useful, but also so enjoyable to watch. Um, and thank you all also to all of you who have attended. We hope you have found it as useful as we have. In due course, we're going to circulate a write-up of the exercise to everyone who attended. And we will also, of course, be going away to consider the many issues this exercise has raised. 
um, and to consider what lessons learned we can take to the sphere of open source evidence and to our methodology with Bellingcat. So thank you all and goodbye for now.